Today we're beginning a new sermon series um, that's going to be a, a study through the book of Nehemiah. And as we are going through the, the book of Nehemiah, we are going, that's going to lead us up to Easter. So for the next nine weeks, we're going to go through Nehemiah. We're going to have a heavy emphasis on the first half of the book. We will get through all of the major themes, most of the verses, but if you go through Nehemiah, you'll see that there's just some things that you'll be grateful that I'm not preaching through. So just, just a heads up, we won't hit every verse, most verses, but we'll go through the book of Nehemiah. The major plot line in the book of Nehemiah is that there is a man in Babylon. There's a man there named Nehemiah, and he is going to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall there. But he's not just going back to rebuild a wall. He's going there also to rebuild people as well. You see, the people that lived in Jerusalem in this day, in this time, were very disillusioned. They were discouraged. Um, they, they had lost their, their purpose in life, that what God wanted to do through their lives individually was not happening. They, they lived very purposeless, a very purposeless existence. But even beyond that, the, the Israelites as a people were not fulfilling the purpose that God had for them, which was to be a blessing to all of the nations. And so that was not taking place either. And Nehemiah, he's going to hear about this and he is going to want to do something about it. And what's interesting is that he's very concerned, mostly concerned, about their spiritual welfare, but he comes into the situation and he builds a wall. He's going to build a wall, which is so ironic because you would think that building a wall, how, what, what connection does building a wall have to do with um, the spiritual vitality of these people? But the physical... You know, we don't always like to admit this, but the physical does sometimes influence the spiritual. It's not the primary influencer, but it does influence it. And Nehemiah knows that unless a wall is built, the city doesn't get populated again. The, the, the city doesn't begin to flourish again. The temple won't flourish again. What is supposed to be happening in the city doesn't happen in the city. And so in some ways, I would even apply that to our situation, that as we are beginning to make physical upgrades and renovations and enhancements, while it's not the primary influencer, we do realize that the physical does influence the spiritual to a certain extent. And so we want to make our facility uh, more functional. We want to make our facility uh, a, a little bit nicer, uh, just upgrading it again, like I would said. Because this physical does influence the spiritual and so Nehemiah is going to go, to ne go there and he's going to have a wall be built. Now allow me to give you some historical context and then, and then we'll, you know, so for those of you that are history buffs, you'll be excited. For those of you that are not, um, don't fall asleep in the next two minutes. The historical context is this, 587, just to help you understand how we've gotten to here. 587 B.C., uh, the Babylonians go into Jerusalem. They destroyed the city. They destroyed the Solomon's temple. Everything is just laid to ruins. They then take the best of the best of the Israelites back to Babylon to resettle them there. That's where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's how they end up back in Babylon. And then about 70 years or so after these, after these wars had taken place, then the Persians go into Babylon and they conquer the Babylonians. And King Cyrus then um, takes a man named uh, Zerubbabel. And so there's just some names that are meant to stay in the Bible, Right? Zerubbabel is one of them. Please do not name anything in your house Zerubbabel. And so Zerubbabel goes back to Jerusalem and he rebuilds the temple, but only a few people go back with Zerubbabel to do this. And then you would think that they would be on track after this. You'd think that they'd be back in line with God's will, God's purposes, but that's not what happens. Instead, the Israelites continued to lean into their father, their grandfathers, their ancestors' sins. They continue to adapt the practices of other religions into their faith, into their lives. And so the temple continues, to, once it's rebuilt, it's still not flourishing, it's still not thriving, and there are no sacrifices, there are no festivals, the priests are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and Nehemiah hears about this. And this is what leads him to what I'm going to call his Popeye moment. And that's really what we're going to be talking about today, is those Popeye moments for us all. The Popeye, you, you remember Popeye, Popeye was a sailor man, right? And he had a girlfriend named Olive Oil. Yes, Olive Oil. Good job. And, and Olive Oil had a tendency to get herself in trouble, didn't she? Every, I mean, she was always getting herself in trouble. And Popeye, though, he could deal with a lot. Popeye could handle a lot. But he could not handle Olive Oil getting herself in trouble, could he? No. 
And he had these statements that he would say. He would say something like, I yams what I yams, and that's all that I yams. He would say stuff like that. But then he had another statement that most of you have probably heard. You may not even know where it came from. I've had all that I can stand, and I can't stand no more. It, it, when olive oil was in trouble, it would always push him to the brink. And he would say, I've had all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. And I want us to say that together. I want to say that together. So on the count of three, I want us to say, I've had all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. On the count of three. Let's all say this together, okay? And if you don't say it well, I'm going to make you say it again. So, just, so if you're thinking about holding out, you know, that's what's ahead of you. On the count of three. One, two, three. I've had all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. Good job. That's the moment. We've had those moments. That's the moment when you step on a scale, right? <laughs> I've had all I can stand, and you know you've got to make a change. It's the moment that you, you know, look at your financial situation, and you know you've got to make a change. It's the moment that you examine your marriage and you realize we were meant to have so much more than this. Maybe even today you're here and you don't even believe in Jesus, but you've been living the life that the world has led you to lead and you've, left your, and you've been left feeling a bit empty, a bit purposeless. You're wondering why you're just drifting. You're wondering why there isn't more to life than what it is that you've been experiencing. And you've had all you can stand, and you can't stand no more with that. And so you want to see what this Jesus thing is about, and so you're here. Or maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you've been a Christian for many years, or maybe just for a few months, but you're at a place where you're just, you know, it feels like there's more to this than what it is that you've been experiencing. But right now, your faith, your walk with Jesus, your following after him has become a bit average, a bit mundane, a bit redundant. And you're just saying to yourself, there has to be more to this than what it is that I've been experiencing. And you're just saying, I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more. It's those great moments in our lives where change occurs. It's those great moments in our lives where the trajectory just seems to take off. It is often birthed out of that I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more type of moments. And when Nehemiah hears about what is happening in Jerusalem, he comes to that place where he says, I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more, and I've got to do something about this. And so as we look into just a few verses today, a few verses in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, we're going to look at some characteristics that lead us to that place, that lead us to the place where we realize that we've had all we can stand and we can't stand no more. And what I want to do is challenge you to examine yourself, to reflect upon where you're at, to not settle for just average, mundane, purposeless, drifting type of an existence that God does want more for you than that. And God wants more for us as a church than that. And so here we are. And we're going to begin reading in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. And this is what it says there. And we'll find some of these characteristics that led Nehemiah to have that kind of a moment. Verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, the 20th year being the 20th year of Artaxerxes reign, while I was in the citadel of Susa. And we'll just stop there. What Nehemiah is doing here is he, he's the author of this book, and he's saying, this is who I am. Nehemiah, he was a Jewish man. He had a Jewish heritage. You know what? If he would have been Persian, he could have cared less about what was happening in Jerusalem. But he wasn't Persian. He was a Jewish man, not by culture, not just by birth, but he truly had a genuinely strong Jewish faith. Like he really believed that there was a God who cared about him and who had a great purpose for him and a purpose for his people, and he wanted to see that purpose fulfilled. I mean, he really believed that. These weren't just words that were spoken. He was also a leader. He was a man who had tremendous upside, tremendous potential. Now, he's also a cupbearer for the king, which basically meant he would bring the king his drink, and, and he would taste it before the king would taste it to make sure that the drink wasn't poisoned. Now, that's a rather, I mean, that's not the typical 
high capacity. That's not like the kind of role that you would put a high capacity person in, but Nehemiah was, Nehemiah was an incredibly high capacity person. He was a leader. He wanted to make things happen. He's in the, he's in the citadel. So he's in a position of influence, but also in a position to, to be exposed to incredible conversations, incredible opportunities for development. And so Nehemiah is talking about who he is. He says, these are the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. And here's the point when it comes, here's my point. When it comes to that, I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more type of moment. Here's the first thing, is that you have to remember who you are. You need to remember who it is that you are. If Nehemiah hadn't been who he was, he would have never did the things that he, we are going to read about him doing. The, and it's not so much that you just remember who you are because you haven't really forgot. You know your name. You know you're a mother, a father, a grandfather, a grandmother. But you remember the implications of who you are. There's a book that was written several years ago. It's entitled Every Man's Battle. And uh, it's the authors of this book, through the book, they, they share a variety of different stories of men who have struggled with the battle of lust. And so that's where the title, Every Man's Battle, comes from. And, and through the course of this book, they share a variety of different stories. And one of the stories of one of the particular men um, stuck with me. And I read this book several years ago, but that story, one particular story stuck with me. And the story was this. Basically, the man was a Christian man, um, but he had this battle. He had this struggle. With, with, this, with this issue of lust. And he couldn't quite overcome it, and it was something that he just found himself wrestling with and battling with, and it, and it was beginning to have an impact on his, on his marriage, on his relationship with his children, and even his interaction with God. And so he's in church one day. Maybe this is even where you're at. He's in church one day, and he's just left saying, there, and he's sitting there, and he's just going, he's mouthing the words to the song, but he's not really thinking about the words. He's thinking about what he's going to eat for lunch, thinking about the football game that he's going to watch later on. And then the preacher gets up, and he begins to talk to him about generational sin. And he, and he talks to him about the fact that this, the issues that we struggle with now do get passed on to our children and our grandchildren, and they begin to affect them as well. And this is the part of the story, this guy's testimony that stood out to me. He said it was in that moment that he remembered he was a father. And he, and he realized that this issue that he had was affecting his children. He remembered that he was a husband. And this issue that he had was affecting his marriage. He began to realize the implications of who he really is. One of the greatest things that you can do in regards to what we're talking about today is just remember who you are and the implications of that. It's to remember that you're a, that you're a mother. You're not a social media junkie. <laughs> and we ought to pay our children more attention than we do to these other social media apps that we like to look at. It's to remember that you're a son or a daughter of somebody. And so you ought to reach out to that mother and that father periodically and engage them. Like, that's who you are. And there's implications with that. You're a child of God. You are a child of God. You know what the deal is with my children? They don't stop being my children because they're bad. Some of you need to be reminded of that. Because you're depressed, you're discouraged because you're not being good enough. And, and yeah, there may be some things that you need to go and get forgiveness for from God, but, but maybe you just need to remember that you're a child of God and you don't have to earn your relationship with him. Instead, it's just something that you accept. You don't resist it because we have children that do that, right? They resist the relationship with, with us as parents. And you're like, come on, you don't have to do that. This is free. I want this. Quit fighting me. And, we're, and you're coming in here maybe and you're fighting that relationship with God because you feel like you just got to be good enough. But you got to remember who you are. You're a child of God. And maybe you can have that moment that all I can stand and I can't stand is no more type of moment. And so Nehemiah, he says, this is who I am. I'm, I'm the son of Hakaliah and I, and I serve in the citadel of Susa. I'm a Jewish man. And then he goes on from there. Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah 
with some other men. And so Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem. He had never been to Judah. But they come back, and what does he do? And he questions them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah in this moment, he, he questions them. He asks questions. He is, he is concerned. He has care for what it is that is taking place there. And you, you know, when you, you ask questions about something, it's because you care about it. And he's worried about the physical condition of Jerusalem, but he's also worried about the, the people's condition in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem. And so he begins to ask questions. Here's the second thing that we learn when it comes to this, I've had all I can stands and I can't stands no more type of moments. It's kind of simple. It's that you care about what is happening. You just care about what is happening. I was speaking with a, uh, a Christian psychologist once, and this man had had the opportunity to counsel hundreds of pastors and um, to pour into thousands of others. And the question I asked him was this. I said, how can I have a great family? And then I, and I added a little bit more to the question. I said, how can I ensure that, that as my children grow older, I have a great relationship with them and that they grow up in the faith and they don't hate the church? Because that kind of happens when it comes to pastors and the church is the children kind of become resentful of the church. And so I'm asking this man, in light of all of your experience, hundreds of people you've spoken to, thousands of people you've counseled, you know, what do you have to say to this? And I, his response blew me away. He said, you just have to care. He said, by far the biggest problem I face when it comes to counseling people in your position is that they just don't care. It's not a priority for them. And then he said, the fact that you're even asking that question is going to put you light years ahead of so many of the people that you're hearing stories about that fail at this. You just have to care. If you don't care about it, nothing's going to happen with it. It's just not going to happen. You have to be willing to ask questions about, hey, how is my marriage right now? I feel like I'm good with God, but maybe, like, let me, let me look into the Bible and try to see if I, let me, let me, like, what does it really mean to be a Christian? Like, we got to be willing to ask some questions like that. You sit down with a child of yours and you say, you know, I feel like our relationship right now, there's some tension. How are we doing? How are you doing? Yeah, it's going to be hard to wade through that. And the, and the answers that you get from them may not even be completely accurate, but at least you're caring. At least you're showing that you care. There, there are many challenges to why it is that we don't ask these questions, why we don't express the care and the concern. One of them is um, that we don't, want to get the, we, don't want to, we don't want to hear. We don't want the truth. Because if we get the truth, then you have to do something about it. So we just don't ask the questions. That's often what happens. You know what the animal is that, um, the animal is that has a reputation for burying its head in the sand when a predator's chasing it? What's that animal? Yeah, it's an ostrich. Yeah, so that's actually not accurate. <laughs> it's actually a myth. It's not, it's not true. I mean, if you think about it, that, like, why would an ostrich do that? Why would they, they run 40 miles an hour. Why would they bury their head in the sand? That doesn't make any sense. And then, and then you're in worse shape because then you're going to suffocate. So that doesn't make any, that, that makes even less sense. They are actually more inclined to run at a predator head on. And the reputation actually came because they bury, they, they dig two to three foot holes and they put their eggs in the holes and they move the eggs around with their beaks. And so it looks like they buried their head into the sand whenever the reality is, is generally the, the reputation for that came because they were moving around the eggs. But here's the deal. While that's a myth with ostriches, I don't know if that's a myth with most of us. We bury our head in the sand. We don't ask questions. We don't want to know what's going on because if we find out what's going on, if we really care, then we're going to have to do something about it. That was one of the big deals in uh, World War II with, those, with the concentration camps. Um, that they were in these community, in these towns where there were just people living their lives and they knew there was something going on, but they weren't exactly sure and they didn't want to know because if they knew, then they might have to do something about it. 
And so then when the allied forces would come into these towns and they would see piles and piles of bodies, they would then bring the citizens out of the towns and then they would expose them to what it is that they were burying their heads in the sand about. This one actually took place in the city of Oradorf. And after the forces took um, the townspeople and the leadership around these camps and showed them the piles of these bodies, uh, the mayor and his wife actually went back to their home and committed suicide. Sometimes you just have to be willing to ask questions and trust that what you're going to find out from God is something that you're going to be able to do something with. And so Nehemiah, he's asking questions about what's going on in Jerusalem. He really wants to know what's happening here. And when he hears about it, it just, it just is devastating. Here's the report that he receives going on in verse 3. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. And so trouble being that they're in physical danger because there isn't a wall around them. Um, they're in disgrace, like that would be more speaking to their character, their spirituality. And so he's saying, like, not only are they in physical danger, but they're in spiritual danger. They're not even honoring God with their lives anymore. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, it's hard for us to kind of wrap our minds around this whole um, a city without walls, because, you know, we, none of our cities have walls anymore. Our, our cities don't need walls anymore. But in this particular day, you would be better off to not have an army and to have a wall than you would be to have the opposite. Because if you don't have walls around your city, then there was absolutely no security. You were completely at the mercy of marauders, thieves, and other in enemies from the outside. The, you're going to be influenced more from the outside than the inside. Nobody lived in a city without walls. The only people that lived in cities without walls in this day were the people that had nowhere else to go. It's hard for us to wrap our mind around that. I was thinking about that this past week, and I did a little bit of research. Have any of you ever been to Camden, New Jersey? Yeah, people, a couple, yeah, did, uh, maybe one or two of you. Nobody goes to Camden, New Jersey, okay? A couple years ago, actually, in Camden, New, and if you do go there, you don't generally stay there. In Camden, New Jersey, a couple years ago, it was the most violent city in America. On a scale, I was, on a scale of one to a hundred, okay, one being terrible, a hundred being perfect, Camden was rated a four for safety right now. There's about 79,000 people who live in Camden. By a national average, you should have about 160 full-time equivalent police officers in that city. 160, okay? They have 40. 40 full-time police officers. Like, that's a city without walls. I read a story about someone who called 911 in Camden because their house had been robbed, and so they call 911, and they say, hey, my house has been robbed. It's been completely looted. Everything's been destroyed. And 911 says, okay, are you still there? And he says, no. And then they say, well, can you go back? Um, and he said, I don't, I don't really want to go back. And he said, well, if you go back, take some pictures and email them to us. <laughs> That's a city without walls. That's the modern day equivalent of a city without walls. Like, it's hard to wrap your mind around, hey, email me the pictures of your house that got robbed when you call 911. That's hard to completely understand. But I'll tell you what happened to me. See, we don't, we don't kind of get that because... Um, 1 a.m., I get, a couple months ago, I get a doorbell. Somebody's ringing my doorbell at 1 a.m. I mean, that's like the kind of stuff that happens in a horror movie. You know, like, who's ringing my doorbell at 1 a.m.? This isn't good. And I look out the window, and it's a police officer. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I got a police officer at my door at 1 a.m. She, she was ringing the doorbell. So I kind of cracked the door open, and she says, I'm sorry to bother you, which is a good sign because they usually don't say that when they're going to arrest you. So, yeah, you know, there is a, they're not sorry to interrupt you when they're about to arrest you, right? So, so they open, so I open up the door, and I'm like, what's, I mean, you know, I'm half asleep. What's going on? Hey, your, door, your garage door's up. Your garage door's up. You should take that down. You know, people, sometimes they come around, and they'll take stuff out of your garage. I mean, I got people, the, the police officer is telling me, it's hard to wrap my mind around, hey, take pictures of your house that just got robbed and email them to us. When I got police officers showing up and saying, hey, your garage door's up. You should put your garage door down. It's just hard to wrap our mind around a city without a wall. Like, there was complete dysfunction and chaos in this city. Nothing was going to function well in Jerusalem because they had no wall that was there. And so, Hannah, see, Hananiah gives Nehemiah an absolutely, completely honest assessment of 
the situation that was there. He could have watered it down. He could have told Nehemiah what he wanted to hear, but he didn't do that. And here's the deal. If you're going to have that all I can stand and I can't stand no more moment, that type of moment that's going to change your life, you got to be willing to do some honest assessing of who you are, where you are, and what it is that's happening around you. A couple years ago, three years ago, I went to the doctor. Uh, first, Actually, the first physical, like, complete checkup that I had ever had done. They drew blood, whole nine yards. They wanted to run all my numbers. The hope was to get a baseline. I felt fine going in strong, healthy, get a good baseline for what healthy and strong really was. And then the doctor calls me and he says, hey, you know, you got, your numbers are really off here. You've got, your glucose is way too high. Your cholesterol is high and your A1C isn't what it should be. And I'm, I'm like, what? I feel great. I feel fine. And he says, yeah, you know, sometimes you're, you're young, so you're not going to feel the implications of this, but you're, you're like pre-diabetic and you got to make some changes. You got you to exercise more re- regularly. You got to cut the carbs and the sugars out of your diet. You know, these are like, these have to become a priority for you or we're going to be having you on medication. To, we're going to have you on medication before long if you don't get this stuff curved. Now that, as, as crazy as that was, that was, actually I've lost 20 pounds since then. But the rub is, is that I had to be willing to go in and get a really honest assessment of things. I had to be willing to, to put myself in a position to hear some hard truths. And maybe that's what you need to do. I'm sure I need to do it. You sit down with your husband, your wife, and you just say, do you feel like I'm loving you right now the way that you need to be loved? Yeah, that's, you might get some, you might hear some things that you don't want to hear. You sit down with your kid and you say, what's going on? What have I done to cause some of these problems? You sit down with an employer, a coworker, and you say, it just feels like things are off right now. What's going on? You sit down with an employee, somebody who maybe even works with you, or works for you, and you just say, I feel like you're off. How can I help you? You're going to hear some things that you don't want to hear. But let me even take it a step further than that and get to the real heart of who we are, ought to be, as Christians. What if you started reading your Bible and you just started, like, what does it really mean to be a Christian? And you start seeing some of the implications of our faith and and you start reading about, hey, oh, I'm not supposed to worry. And Jesus actually talked about fasting. Like, that means I don't eat. I mean, how many times have I not eaten in a day? Like, that never happens. And our treasures should be in heaven and not on earth, and I shouldn't judge others. And, oh, man. Like, that's really getting an honest assessment of who we are. You've got to be willing to do that if you're going to have that all I can stands and I can't stands no more type of moment. And this is what Nehemiah's response is. Verse 4, When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was a leader. He was a go-getter. He was the kind of guy that that could make something happen. He could have ran after it and tried to resolve this situation. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he takes some time to seek God for a solution. You know, maybe you've been led to that place now where you're at this place where you need to have that moment of, I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more. And if you are at that place where you've had that particular moment, then the first step is to seek God for a solution. You know, in Acts chapter 1, um, when the disciples, uh, they had just lost Judas, and they're, they're looking for somebody to replace Judas, um, they, they, they didn't just run forward and just pick the best candidate. They They prayed. And they would let God lead them to Matthias. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John are just coming out of prison, they come and they interact with the disciples in a home. And it's when they interact with these disciples that they begin to pray about this new situation that they're in in which they're going to deal with persecution. And so... They don't pray that God will protect them or keep them safe. They say, God, help us to continue with all boldness to continue to proclaim 
this good news that is yours. You see, whenever you get brought to that moment of you've had all you can stand and you can't stand no more, you know, the first step is to seek God. But then you've got to remember who you are. That's what's going to lead you there. You've got to do an honest assessment of the situation. You've got to care about what's happening. And then go to God with that thing. Once you figure out what it is, go to God with that thing and then be willing to do something about it. And so as Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls there, um, he's also going to rebuild the people. And hopefully as we go through this book over these next several weeks, couple of months, uh, we will all be getting rebuilt a little bit through that time. Let's have a word of prayer. And we'll have one last closing song. Thank you, Father, for your son and, Father, for the hope that we have in him. We're so grateful that, that you're God that is near us. Help us, Lord, as we have maybe had our eyes open to these things in our lives that we need to change. May they be things that we change that will help us to grow closer to you, become more after, like your son. Let me give you all this in Jesus' name.